had my own mindset. I was raised by good parents, but I had my own mindset. You know, I decided, you know, I was going to do life my way. And of course, when you start doing life your way as a, as a teen and stuff like that, as a young boy, you know, you end up going astray. And I went astray, uh, ended up uh, on drugs, um, getting in trouble, uh, ended up shooting somebody. And Judge Jenkins sent me into the military as opposed to sending me into the juvenile courts, into the juvenile lockup system, feeling that that would be much better for me. I would actually. Idea was thought was I would spend more time in there than I would in lockup. Uh, of course, that didn't work out either because my behavior, you know, just escalated. You know, the more I was exposed to other ideas and other thoughts and other cultures and different things like that. But I uh, got out of the military, uh, attending OIC, got a GED, did some studies at Tennessee State University, wanted to become a fashion designer. But my heroin addiction got the best of me, and uh, of course, that's. My life started spiraling downward, ended up incarcerated in the state prison system for a number of years and uh, got released and back into my old behaviors in, on August 24th, 1986. God divinely intervened in my life, stopped a 17 plus year drug addiction and a lifestyle of crime and crazy behavior and called me into ministry. That's what I've been doing ever since. Mm -hmm. Ms. Hawkins, what about your background, education, some of the in information? All right, my name is Tiffany Hawkins. I have a domestic violence nonprofit called V2V, From Victims to Victory. I was prompted to start it um, after coming out of domestic relationship for years. And the struggle going through it is really both, is need an education for both the man and the woman coming through because dealing with someone coming out of domestic violence is kind of like what we said earlier, it's like going to war. We kind of get shell-shocked. So, um, and my husband has a program called Dads Against Destruction mm -hmm. where he's working with restoring the men. So it's, it's a family thing that needs to be done when making that change. Mm -hmm. Ms. Johnson. My name is Sparkle. I'm 34 years old. I am also a survivor of domestic violence. I've been a survivor for three years. I was in a six-year domestic violence relationship. I now have my own nonprofit. I'm a graduate from Hillsborough House High School and I'm scheduled to start TSU in August as an undergrad. And just like Pastor said, uh, I got in a lot of trouble and things of that nature and I'm actually writing a book called Prison to Prison. Mm -hmm where I'm telling my story about being in prison for being a suspect once, and then also being a victim and being mentally and abusively in prison. Mm -hmm. and, and so in a real sense, the three of you have a lot of information to give our audience concerning efforts to overcome uh, domestic violence and some of the things that not only have impacted your lives, but uh, more than likely uh, impacted uh, others as well, which is to say that when we get into these kinds of situations, not only it, does it have an impact upon us, but it also have an impact upon those around us. As a matter of fact, I yes. think that that is one thing that has come through quite clear talking to the three of you is that, uh, that uh, there are others outside of ourselves who are impacted by some of the things that we do. And, and so I'm delighted to have an opportunity to bring the three of you together so that we can talk about uh, some of the issues of overcoming domestic violence. And so what we'll do is to take our first commercial break and then we'll come back and we'll try to uh, leave the audience with some information as to how people might be able to overcome domestic violence. And we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break.
Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the show for today. We're talking to Pastor Walker, uh, Ms. Hawkins, and uh, Ms. Johnson in reference to overcoming domestic violence. And so, Ms. Johnson, as we promised uh, the last time, we'd give you an opportunity to start us off talking about methods whereby people might be able to overcome domestic violence. And of course, uh, Ms. Uh, Watkins, uh, Ms. Hawkins will <laughs> follow that, and Pastor Walker will give us some information in reference to that during this second segment. Let's start with you, Ms. Johnson. And then Ms. Hawkins. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start, Ms. Johnson. Well, first, the most important thing is notice the red signs, but also act on those red signs. Mm. Or red flags, I'm sorry. When I had red, I, when I tell you all, I had the best red flags and ignored every last one of them. One of the best ones, he told me he hit women. Mm -hmm. I was playfully hit him in his shoulder and he said, hey, hey, with a serious face, he said, hey, I hit women. <laughs> and I was like, whatever. I didn't think anyone was that bold yeah. to say that. And then I met his mom. And his mom said, I'm going to pray for you for getting involved with my son. And the third best red flag I had was he was going to court on a pending domestic violence charge. Mm -hmm. And I ignored, and this was in the first month that I met him, I found all this out. Mm -hmm. And went nowhere. And then six years later, that very man, and three children later, my life was almost taken. Mm -hmm. So notice those red flags. Act on those red flags immediately. What do you think about that, Ms. Hawkins? I totally agree. A lot of times we want everything that, to gleam to be gold, mm -hmm. and it's not. You know, we want what we think we want. And we also need to look at our children, look at the ones that's being involved in it, because we take down a whole family with dealing with someone who really don't care anything for us, have no respect at all for us. And I suggest counseling, not only for the surviving, because I say that we're always surviving, so we're not a survivor because we hadn't completed it. Uh, get counseling for the surviving as well as the children. Mm -hmm. A lot of times the children are overlooked in that process because they w may not have been the one physically but that mental picture that we paint in their head mm -hmm. for them listening to night after night, you know, watching mom get up and clean up a broken up house and mm -hmm. uh, trying to hire bruises thinking that's normal. Mm -hmm. We want our children to know that balance is not the new normal. We need to take on the whole aspect of anyone that was connected as a support team mm -hmm. to get the help. That's the main thing into working with them and whomever we get involved with, they have to know up front, this is what happened. And you have to set your boundaries. Because of this that happened, I cannot allow this, this, or this mm -hmm. at no time. And mm -hmm. once we set those boundaries, stand on those boundaries. It doesn't do any good to have them set, like Sparkle said, see the signs and know they're there and you still work on mm -hmm. it as if you're God. Mm -hmm. So we can't ask him to help us if we're not going to mm -hmm. take the help that he give us. That's mm -hmm. You know, Dr. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times, a lot of men, I think their manhood is founded on purely physical, you know, and in terms of thinking that, you know, in order for me to be in, in control, for me to be in charge, mm -hmm. you know, then I have to be physical. You know, I have to uh, put her in her place, you know, and and then you guys, I think a lot of insecurities as well that goes along with that too. Uh, man being insecure in, in terms of in a woman here, a man wants a strong woman, but then when she uh, displays her strength, mm -hmm. then he becomes uh, challenged or, or fearful or that insecurity kind of rises to the surface, mm -hmm. you know, and, and he's got this thing that goes on in his mind, you know, well, I'm going to put you in your place. And the only way that he know how to do it mm -hmm. is through violence, you know, which makes no sense at all. And, you know, then you got men that think, you got the thought process out there that, uh, well, she, I treat her right. She, she want me to hit her, you know. Mm -hmm. She ain't satisfied mm -hmm. unless I put my hands on her and stuff like that. And of course, you know, we all know that it don't make sense at all mm -hmm. whatsoever. But that's a thought process that's out there that men walk around with, you know. And, 
and another thing is, you know, I, I tell men all the time, I said, man, one of the best things you can learn how to do is cry, <laughs> you know, because mm -hmm. you learn how to cry, man. You can, you can get yourself, you, you can stay out of jail. Mm -hmm. You, you mm -hmm. can uh, avoid being an abuser mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because a lot of times what it is, man, you know, you, you receive pain mm -hmm. and hurt, emotional pain and hurt, and instead of dealing with that pain, then what you want to do is share sure. it, you mm -hmm. know. And then when you're trying, when you're sharing it, you, you, and it's not like you're sitting down having a conversation, say, "Well, you know, when you said this, you, my feelings were hurt or something like that." No, it's not that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to share my pain with you in a physical way because my manhood is founded on purely physical things, mm -hmm. you know. And that's how I control. You know, if I'm dealing with an, another individual, another man, you know, you step to me, you know, what I'm saying it's going, we're going to get physical. You know, and then same thing, you know, that that mindset, you know, goes into our relationships, you know, with with women as well. So and, and that's that's a lot out there, man, that, you know, that men deal with. And when you're afraid to deal with yourself and to confront your own self and deal with your own issues, then what you'll do, man, you'll lash out at the person that's closest to you and then you'll end up hurting them. And. Then now you want to run and say, well, I'm sorry, this, I won't do it again, you know, this will never happen again. But at the same time, how can you say that when you've never, when you haven't dealt with the core issue that caused you to do it in the first place? So in other words, you're just mouthing some stuff off. And then, you know, like you said, you know, you hang around, you hang around, and the red flags are there, but like you say, you ignore the red flags, but this guy's flying red flags everywhere. <laughs> the woman's ignoring him, he's ignoring him. He's not just ignoring him. He's just, he just not dealing with him. You know, I'm just not going to deal with it. You know, I'm a man. You know, I, I can handle mine. And in all reality, you're not handling anything. And you're anything. the cause of all of mine anyway. Oh, yeah, without a doubt, yeah. A lot of times they don't even think that they're, they are the issue. They don't even right. see that what they're doing is wrong. They find a way to put it on that uh, survivor. They find a way to make it that person's fault, and it's not my fault. So no matter how many red flags, he, you see red, he see green. <laughs> so he's going to keep going because, like he said, he's proven his manhood. Mm -hmm. I'm flexing to you. Mm -hmm. Very good. And so what we'll do, we'll take our second commercial break, and then when we come back, we'll have 10 minutes to uh, sort of round this off. And I think the uh, information that you're giving now is excellent. Uh, it's information that is much needed, and I think it does point a way how people might be able to overcome some of the challenges of domestic violence. And of course, we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. We're talking to Pastor Walker, uh, Ms. Hawkins, and uh, Ms. Johnson in reference to efforts to overcome domestic violence. And I think, uh, Ms. Haw uh, Hawkins, we promise you that uh, we'll give you an opportunity to start us off during this last segment. And after you make some statements, uh, Ms. Johnson will uh, talk about some of the things in reference to 
uh, domestic violence and overcoming domestic violence. And Pastor Walker will close us off for the day. Let's start off, uh, Ms. Hawkins. All right. Uh, again, my name is Tiffany Hawkins. I, coming through domestic violence, I think that one of the most important thing is when you start in a relationship, for you and your spouse, or you and your potential spouse. Significant other. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. get a chance to know each other. You mm -hmm. cannot come from out of the jungle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Being in a domestic relationship is, is war. So you cannot come from out of a jungle mm -hmm. and go directly into civilization mm -hmm. and expecting everything to be good. Mm -hmm. And for the person that's speaking with the person that you're talking with, they need to know you. You know, it's a hard thing out here to trust, to build trust again once you've been hurt, mentally and physically. And it's a hard thing for someone if they have never dealt with a domestic situation to understand and offer assistance to that lady or that man. I feel that, like I said, they're getting counseling. The, the uh, survivor should be getting counseling along with her children. But at some point, that potential needs to get it as well, to know how to deal with that person. They need to learn the ways. They need to learn how important it is not to cross those boundaries, the, the monster that they create, because it puts that person immediately on defense. And once they've been on that fence for so long, there's no coming off of it. No matter how much love there, no matter how much good intentions are there, the, the hurt is just there and the fear. And it's not that you're running from something, you're running to something. You're running to that safe place. And that's to be away from somewhere where I feel like I'm intimidated. You know, uh, as I spoke earlier, my husband has a program called uh, Dads Against Destruction, Restoring Fatherhood, which help, uh, also helps young men that's coming out of incarceration or just had a bad bout in life, help them find their ways, help them be the men in their household. So you, you would need a program or something like that that can help you cope with this person if you feel that you want to deal with it. It's not going to be something that's going to happen overnight, and your alpha male ego can't take precedence over those feelings because every time it's just going to cause turmoil mm. and um, an outrage and cause more confusion than need to be. Mm -hmm. So I really think that everyone should get to know that person before moving to the mm -hmm. next relationship and actually calling it a relationship. Mm -hmm. That's right. Ms. Johnson? Uh, I agree 110% mm -hmm. because unlike Ms. Hawkins, I'm single and I tried after a year of being out of that situation. I thought I was ready. And I have had failed dating experiences back to back to back. And now justifiably they were wrong in some instances, but most of it boiled down to me not being ready. Um, PTSD for mm -hmm. domestic violence victims mm -hmm. is real. Um, sometimes it could be just a smell. Uh, I dated one guy that wore the same cologne, mm -hmm. and I completely flipped out. Mm -hmm. I wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talk a lot, and one minute she'll hear me say I'm dating this guy, and the next minute she's like, so how are you and so, so? Oh, he gone. <laughs> He's gone. And, and a part of it is good because I know my worth now, but however, I'm still healing. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to be what anybody else needs me mm -hmm. to be right now. So we have to slow down. We have to get to know people. We have to feel safe again, but they have to understand that. Mm -hmm. So I think it was really great that Ms. Hawkins said that counseling needs to take place mm -hmm. because it's a struggle. Of course, nobody wants to be alone. And of course, it's a sense of power. I want to get just a little deep, if that's OK. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's a sense of power there because every time one of these relationships fail and I realize that it's my fault, mm -hmm. a part of me get upset. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> So I get good. upset with myself because I feel like he's incarcerated, he's serving 20 years, but he has control over my life mm -hmm. to where I can't have a healthy relationship mm -hmm. and he's been gone for three years. Mm -hmm. So it's a sense of frustration there, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. No, very good, <laughs> Pastor. You know, I, you, know, I, you know, people stand on the outside and look in, man, and, and think they know what's going on mm -hmm. and don't even realize, you know, 
just the, the impact, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, someone could, how it can affect someone that's been involved in a, mm -hmm. in a domestic violence situation, you know. <clears throat> you know, I, uh, my daughter was murdered in a domestic violence situation mm -hmm. back in, in uh, 2015, you know, the day before my birthday. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you, you sit back and you look and you don't see nothing wrong. You know what I'm saying? You don't you don't see anything out of whack, you know. And then all of a sudden, something like this, you know, something like that happens, you know. And people don't realize. I don't think people understand just what a, a woman would go through. And you know, you talk about, you know, a woman getting to know the man before you just get deeper into the relationship. But at the same time, you need to make sure the man knows who he is because mm -hmm. if he has no clue as yes. to who he is, man, I lived many years of my life without really even knowing who I was, man. You know what I'm saying? So I just, I always went to the, went with the flow, man. You know what I'm saying? Because I really didn't know who I was. I didn't really, I wasn't really in touch with my own uh, feelings, feelings, my man. own desires. I mean, I lived many years, you know, and really just didn't really, I had feelings, but I didn't display those feelings. You know what I'm saying? And when they did come out, they always came out in a negative way. You know, and it, it wasn't until I started looking deep on the inside of me and get to getting to know myself that I was able to share the real me, you know, with someone. And, and you know, you don't know it. If you don't know, you don't know. But when you got a, in a relationship with somebody and you say, well, you know what? Uh, you don't know everything. I don't know everything. But we can get some counseling that together we can learn and grow together. Yeah. And then the person starts shying away from that. That's a man. I believe right there. That's a red flag right yeah. there. Because what they're saying is, what they're saying. I think, and a man does it. I, I think that's what it's saying to the woman is that, look, I already know who I am. You know, mm -hmm. I don't need to. You go get you some counseling and stuff. But in reality, I'm insecure mm -hmm. to the degree that I don't want to get get open up. And allow bit, uh, you to get that close to me, mm -hmm, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? But at the same time, I want to be in a relationship with mm -hmm. you, but I don't want you to get that close. But I don't want to open up and let you get close to me. So, I mean, what is that really saying? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, but one thing is saying, I'm not, I'm not committed to anything. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to be with me on my terms. If you can't be with me on my terms, then, that, you know, we just won't. It's just not going to happen. And so in a real sense, it always pays to talk about uh, what's going on in the real sense. You have to. Mm -hmm. Communication. And that's why each of you keep talking about counseling, counseling, and counseling. But you don't have to go to an official counselor. There ought to be somebody within all of our lives that we can talk to about these kinds of situations. Would that be? A lot of times, especially dealing with domestic, <laughs> that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Because what you don't want to do is pour your heart out to someone mm -hmm. and you're hurting and you hear it again. You th it's thrown back up in your face, whether they've told someone or they blurted out in the heat of an argument, mm -hmm. and that knocks you down mm -hmm. one more level mm -hmm. because right. here you have opened up to this person and, and poured yourself out and they done that. So, but if I go to a professional, I can sue you. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If sense. you tell mm -hmm. my story, you know, mm -hmm. then, so they have a reason not to talk. Mm -hmm. This is just me personally. Very good. And of course, let me uh, thank the uh, three of you for bringing by that excellent information uh, in reference to overcoming domestic violence as well as domestic violence. And the only thing that we can say is that uh, we hope that uh, uh, individuals who might see this might have another insight into how some of the things that the three of you have talked about this morning uh, might help them overcome some of the challenges that they face in their, uh, their own lives. And so mm -hmm. you never can tell. But I think that uh, as long as the word is 